Hi, my name is Raquel Valdelamar, and welcome to the Mega Podcast, where I speak with high achievers on how they fulfill their professional dreams while maintaining balance throughout their lives. Today, I am speaking with Tammy Pardee, founder and CEO of Party Properties, which has established a dramatic new standard of success in real estate. She is the creator of a cutting-edge concierge brokerage model using specialized teams to create life-changing client experiences in buying and selling homes. Since its inception in 2004, Party Properties has sold over $5.8 billion worth of residential and commercial real estate and grown to four offices across California. Ranked as one of the top 10 real estate agents in California since 2008, Tammy has represented A-list celebrities and tech industry pioneers, as well as advised some of the world's most renowned architects in their development projects. In 2001, she was diagnosed with the autoimmune disease multiple sclerosis, which can leave some with permanent nerve damage in the brain, spine, and other body parts. This diagnosis made her realize she needed to live her life with purpose and vision. Party Properties fosters wellness in and out of the workplace with holiday parties and paid retreat for her employees, and through her giving back program that devotes a portion of the firm's commission from each property to the local charity of the client's choice. Tammy is the mother of four children and fiance to her partner, John Moose. Along with her work priorities, she makes sure to balance her time with her partner with fun getaways and to have dance parties with her kids. (laughs) Tammy, welcome to the Mega Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's so good to have you here. (laughs) It's good to see you. I want you to tell me, what does Tiger Woman mean to you? Well, Tiger Woman is a name my dad, my dad actually um, named me as a kid. And I didn't think anything about it for years and years. I just, that was my name and I could kind of do anything. And the interesting thing is my dad actually has um, Parkinson's, he's stage five right now. And I never actually asked him exactly why he named me that. And so we did last time I was there in Dallas with him and he's like, because you're fierce. And she, and he actually said, and you never, like my brother's kind of a, you know, I don't know, he can be a bully at times. And he's like, and you could always take on your brother. (laughs) (laughs) And he gave that to you at a very young age. Very young. I was about like five years old. Really? Yeah. Really. And how do you think that identity I mean, to know that you could, you were a tire woman, you could do anything. Mm -hmm. How do you think that identity shaped you? I think it was really great. I mean, for a dad to say that to his daughter at the time of Mm -hmm. like, you can do anything as a woman. He never, he never made it different for me and my brother that I couldn't do something or my brother could, Mm -hmm. which actually was really impactful for me. Um, now that I'm older, I realize Tiger isn't actually me. It's like he kind of gave me a Tiger always to be by my side. That's kind of where I've gone with it. And, you know, I'm 50 mm-hmm. now. Um, and it's been actually something that I've carried with me. I'm like, okay, I have the strength inside of me. Because a Tiger can be fierce, but a Tiger is also can be noble and mm-hmm. regal, right? Yeah. So it's all how you're looking at and and seeing that tiger, yeah. a tiger can be masculine or feminine. It yeah. could be a boy or girl. It's just a tiger, right? Would you say that's your spirit animal? It's definitely my spirit animal. <laughs> I love yes. that. A tiger is definitely, <laughs> and it's the year of the tiger, so it's all coming <laughs> around this year. You had really great parents, it seemed like. I mean, it's. I remember it's part of my preparation for this, uh, this, this interview. You said, my dad taught me to think and my mom taught me to work. Yes, that is true. I, you know, I do have great parents. I am, you know, my mom was hard. My mom was a tough mom. My mom was not the, like, let's snuggle up type. Is I read that <laughs> she made you get up at 6 a.m. and go pick strawberries with migrant workers from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Yeah, so she, we called it Camp Strawberry because uh-huh. all my friends went to camp and Tammy uh-huh. went to the farm with oh, her. Oh, wow. Which my but you thought that was dad. normal. Yeah, and I, and to be honest with you, it taught me a lot about, like, the world because I was mm-hmm. there with, you know, all the immigrants and the rest, and they were so kind to me. And I was little, like I was mm-hmm. little and I was picking and I would get 25 cents a crate. And um, to me at the time, it was like, I learned how to make money. I also learned that like everybody's different, but everyone's the same. And everyone was so kind to me mm-hmm. that I, it taught me to just be loved and accepting, but also that they loved and accepted me. Cause I was like this little girl out in the strawberry fields. I, must have thought I, was, I think I was like five or six. Wow. I was small. 
Wow. My mom, I think my mom worked. So that was her way of like, mm -hmm. it was kind of like babysitting me, but really working. And she wanted to teach me to work and she did. And it was, it was very impactful. And we laugh about it because literally my family is like, and then Cam Tammy went to you know, <laughs> <kept a> strawberry. <laughs> Do you think that's a place of how your work ethic was developed? I think it's one of the, the, one of them. Yeah. I definitely, I think that was important. Mm -hmm. Um, growing up and always just, I mean, I always liked to work. I always wanted to be um, independent to a little bit of my family mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so. And you said that your dad taught you poetry. He taught you, to, he made you memorize poetry. He did. He, he did. He, um, somebody said it couldn't be done as the first one I memorized with him. Um, and he was, my dad, my, both of my parents were farmers. So mm -hmm. I think it was important for them to like really create and learn. And my dad read a lot of books because that's how he learned. And so yeah. he wanted to implement that very young, almost too young at some of it. Some of it's like, he's like wanted us to read the prophet at like 10 years old. I'm like, I don't understand this at all, dad. You know, now I understand it. Mm -hmm. And now I understand all the things he was trying to teach me then. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I get it, dad. I get mm -hmm. it. What so. are some of the favorite poems that he taught you? You know, I would say that there was a lot of poems, but the, the biggest thing to me are the little sayings and like, like, I think that you can, and I try to do this with my kids too. And they laugh um, with my mom and my dad. Like they always had these little teeny things. Like my mom would say, you attract more bees with honey. Mm -hmm. um, the sun always rises. Um, you know, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, mm. which I use all the time. Um, if you take care of your farm, your farm will take care of you. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, if they, you know, they probably copied these from all these different people, but and my dad always like to thyself be true, which is obviously a famous one, but all of them. And then having those snippets in my mind growing up, I can, I go back to them all the time in business and I'm like, oh, like this too. is how this applies. This yeah. is how this applies. And I think that helps me. It really does. I think there's something beautiful about just short, pithy, just beautiful quotes that, that, that packs so much into just this little just this little piece and people remember that it rather they remember those little sayings rather than like this long monologue of something you need to do right and it's funny because with my kids now my mom has one never travel alone which means pick up your stuff as you go mm -hmm. and that's the rule in our house because i'm like i don't you know and it's interesting because they, they they laugh and they're like oh there we go mom i'm never traveling alone i'm like great <laughs> don't travel alone you know and <laughs> So there, are, it's like, it's fun to give that to them too, because I, I think that if anything travels with time with families, I think those are the types of patterning and things you actually want to travel with mm -hmm. your family, not some of the other patterning probably, yeah. you know? So. so you grew up in Oregon? I grew up in Oregon, yeah. Really? And then yeah. you went to Boston University. Yeah, I went to BU. I followed... My sister, my sister went oh, to yeah. BU. Oh yeah, a terrier. Yeah. Um, I followed my high school boyfriend there and I'm really happy I did um, because I was from a small town. My, my Boston U was twice the size of my hometown. Mm -hmm. So going there and meeting everybody from all over the world, which is so eye-opening for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was Boston like compared to Oregon? Oh, my God. Totally. It was like so <laughs> different. Yeah. Um, I mean, Oregon's very cool now. When I was there, it was not. It was very, very, very hippie. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very cosmopolitan for me, Boston was. And I got to meet... I mean, I, Oregon, everyone's friendly. So they say hi to everyone. So I would go down the streets in Boston and be like, hi, oh my gosh, hi, it's nice to meet you. Hi, mm -hmm. hi. And everyone's like, you're going to get killed. Like, you can't say hi to everyone. I'm like, yeah, I can. Like, why wouldn't I? I met everybody there. And yeah. it was like so great. And I still am friends with them to this day because, and I knew so many people. And I think I, I brought my part of who I was growing up to them. And I think it shocked them. And they loved it. Yeah. I remember yeah. living in New York for, after college and I grew up in, from like 10 to 21. I grew up in Texas. And yeah. in Texas, there's just like just hospitality. Everyone's nice. Everyone yeah. says hello. And I, that's what I grew up with. And then when I went to New York, it was a very different experience. Yeah. And they were just like, you're not from here, are you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it just it's interesting to see how like you grew up in these different places and then you go to like a very urban city and it's a little bit of a shock. Yeah. 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 What did you study? Um, marketing. I got my business degree there originally. And so. then after that, did you move to LA? Yeah, I moved back to Oregon and okay. we were going to get married. Uh -huh. um, uh, and I decided that wasn't a good thing. So I drove in, I got put, packed my car up and I drove to LA. 
Really? And everybody was like, are you really going? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. And I did. So I and went to a room. You, when you came to LA, you became the personal assistant of the actress Sharon Stone. Yes, I did. Um, How oh did gosh. you land that job? You know, it was interesting. So everything is connection. Like, so if you, yeah. everything, your your life completely unfolds if your eyes are open, right? So you have to be open to it. So when I had graduated from college, I went um, to Europe for the summer. I met this girl. Her sister worked at Paramount Pictures. I kept in touch with her. I got in touch with her sister. I worked at Paramount in PR. And um, and I was just kind and nice to everyone. And this man, Stanley Brosse, who was a big publicist at the time, um, introduced like I was an assistant he's like you there's something special about you I think that you would really like to work with this like you'd be a good fit but he didn't say that to me mm -hmm. he actually didn't say anything to me and she actually called me and <laughs> she called me at my office and I'm like she's like this is Sharon Stone is Tammy there I'm like uh like uh, yeah, this is Tammy. <laughs> was she the household name at that time? She was the household okay, name. Okay. She just came off of Basic Instinct. Oh wow! Okay. So it was. Wow. It was so, yeah. like I was like because I thought she was calling for my boss, who was yeah. amazing. Carol Sewell, the best. She was the best boss ever. Oh my god! And um and so then I went and I met with her, and um and I got the job. And she asked. I remember she asked me if I could type, and I really couldn't type that well. <laughs> I still can't type that well, to be honest with you. And I was like, uh, yeah, I could. I can type, and I um. I never had to type for, thank God. But um, yeah, and I started working for it. It was really an interesting, very dynamic. Um, I learned a lot in that job. It says in my research that one of the things she taught you was there is no such thing as the word no. Right. She did teach me that. She taught me a lot of things. And what she, I mean, literally, and if you think about it, there is... There's if there's a will, there's a way to do everything. And we were remodeling her house at the time or she was remodeling her house. And because my parents were both builders, which she didn't know originally, I was I became the manager of this whole huge remodel. And so she'd be like, I want the you know, I want the foyer painted. Well, she had like a 40 foot high foyer by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, and she's like, I do not want to hear no. And I'm like, oh, God, OK. So, you know, I just you just do it. I went to the paint store, found the painters, got the paint and paid them and fed them all night. And they were like hanging off like, I mean, ladders and everything. And we got it done, you wow. know, so. Um, so and she taught you no. Done. She taught you like, just like, don't say no. Yeah. She said to me, never don't. say no to me. Like, never say that you can't do something. Give me, tell me how it can be done. And I might say, I don't want to, you know, it's too expensive mm -hmm. or it's, it's like, it doesn't make sense. But I don't want to hear that. No, it can't be done. One of the things I always loved about her was just how she represented this obvious just sexiness, this this woman, but there was this strength, yeah, you know, in her. And I think just that goes back to just this nose, like she just she found a way to get it done, and that that strength is so beautiful. Yeah, she's she's tough as nails, man. She was she was she was tough, and but I did it, and I was so um, honored to be able to do it for her at the time too. And um, yeah, she's. She's and she's smart, she's smart and beautiful. So, yes, that's a powerful combination. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you started your company in 2004. Yes. What prompted I did. you to start Tammy Parties? Um, you know, I think that I was having I had a, I had a baby, mm -hmm. Taylor. I call her my golden child. She's going she mm -hmm. just got in. She's going to Berkeley. So that's very exciting. That's congratulations. Yeah, thank that is, you. That is huge. Yes, yes. Wow. So I'm very, we're going up actually this weekend. I'm going up tomorrow. That to is so Cal exciting. Day. She's going to Berkeley. Yeah. Wow. So um, so at the very beginning, I had her and mm -hmm. I actually miscalculated my monthly, like what it would cost monthly for our house and, and having it like part time. I wanted a part time nanny. Mm -hmm. And so when I did that, I decided I had to go back to work and I wanted to figure out something that I could do that I loved. And I loved homes and design and I had flipped houses and my parents were builders. And so I really understood that. So I went back and I got my license when I was actually, she was literally just born. And I also realized I couldn't be a stay-at-home mom because that is the hardest job that there is for every woman that is a stay-at-home mom. That is literally the hardest job I think in the world. Um, and I just, I... I was really breaking, not doing well doing that. So um, I went and I got my license and I started working and I was in some mom's groups and I sold three houses to three of the moms and um, I sold $33 million my first year. 
which at the time was a huge number, still is a really big number actually. And, um, and I, at the time I, I just, and I still love, I loved the connection and I realized that that was like what I was meant to do. So, and that's how party properties started. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I worked at Remax and I didn't like the balloon logo to be completely honest (laughs) with you. I was like, I am not going to associate myself with the balloon logo for, I mean, the rest of my life. So I tried to do my own marketing and branding because that's what I went to school for and they wouldn't let me. And I, I got my MBA in entrepreneurship. And so I was like, I'm just going to go on my own. Like, why would I not do this? So we started in one of the, the back bedroom at my house and there was like okay. six of us at the end. Then we got our, that's we got an how office it all started. Yeah. One of the things that makes party properties different from all these other brokerage firms is that you use best practices from the entertainment and the production industry mm-hmm. when you formed your company. And that created an enormous amount of success. Talk about the what you use. What exactly did you use mm-hmm. from the entertainment and the production industry for your real estate firm? Right. So when I came into real estate, I just felt like the model was really broken. Like it, it was so archaic. It was single agents, maybe with an assistant kind of running around. And I'm like, this doesn't work. So what I did is I really associated it because I did TV and movie production as well um, in my Sharon era. Um, It was like pre-production, you know, production, and then post-production. And each had a team on it and people, and people specialized in those areas. So when I applied that model to real estate, it's like we have the marketing team, the pre-production prep, right? Mm -hmm. We've got the production is like when we're showing the house, selling house, getting another contract. And then we have the post, which is another kind of little team. So we have somebody like the producer, which is the listing agent, which is myself and Paige that go and other people, we have obviously other agents at the company that take it all the way through. But there's different areas where people specialize, like a a producer might not specialize in the paperwork that actually goes, goes together with everything or the compliance of the deal. So we have those people just like in production in place in our company. And it's just so effective. It's so efficient the errors are very minimal at all, if at all, really. And it's just a better client experience going through it. So that's incredible. What's also what I love to see is how you took these years of working in the entertainment industry, and then you took the analogies of what you thought could work into a totally different industry and in many ways, archaic. Right. And you said, I'm going to change this model and see how it works for me. And now it seems like more and more companies are actually adopting your model. Right. You know, so you were in a way a trailblazer for right. for this. So, so I just think, you know, to all the people who are watching this, if they're, you know, work in an industry and you may not like it, you can, you know, study it, learn it, because then you can go wherever you go next. You don't know what you're going to take, what applications you're going to take somewhere else like you didn't probably right. even realize oh wow like the pre-production the post-production all you know this model right. that i'm going to use that in real estate later on right i didn't realize it i did love i mean production is the entertainment industry is it's pretty efficient actually because it has to be and i worked on live tv shows this is before reality but live so mm-hmm. i would implement buildings music shows all of that and when you're live you're like go time right mm-hmm. so and i love being i'm like efficiency is like so important to me i can't stand inefficiency so it it was just interesting for me i was like you know i was like this is a great model for this and it is so efficient and time is money in any deal especially in real estate and it's big money right so if you're five or six days late on a close, that's like a lot of money. So the way I put it together is so efficient that it saved my clients a lot of money, made my clients a lot of money on the hand, other hand too. And it's just, and it's just, a, it's such a better experience. Right. Well, you, when you talk about efficiency being so important, I mean, if you're going to run a company and then also have a family and have your health and right. be able to sleep and take care of your nutrition and manage your fitness and your wellness, like you have to be very efficient. If you're not efficient, it's like, you're just going to get sucked in. I mean, you're going to get sucked in with your time doing something and then you're going to have no time left for something else. So with building this company, how do you incorporate like efficiency into your fitness and your own wellness? You know, that's interesting because I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes you can lose way, you lose your way. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what I did. Um, about five or six years ago, I realized that I was working an incredible, like way too much. 
And I was stressed out and I was a little bit like on edge. And it was just, the, I would say the tiger was not in the right, <laughs> was not being a cub, was being more of a tiger. And, and I didn't like that. Like, I don't want to live like that. It doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make anyone feel good. Right. So um, I kind of reevaluated my life, to be honest with you. I was married at the time. I ended up getting divorced um, and reevaluated my life. And how that started was I started walking in the morning mm. and I would get up when this, everything was kind of, I would walk for like two hours. I would start walking at like 5 a.m. Really? Um, Cause That's... I had to do it before the kids were up and I would go at like sometimes at 4.30 to be honest, which was a little early. I would bring my weights for safety cause we're in LA. So I had these <laughs> weights and it was like, and then I had these great arms. Everyone's like, oh my God, your arms are so amazing. I'm like, I've been doing this because I have to bring them for, you know, walking in Venice yeah. Beach at 4.30 yeah. in the morning is probably not the safest It's still thing. dark. Not oh, yeah, it was still dark. It was not... just, it, but, but to me, I would put on music and I would choose music that really like moved me. And I have, yeah. I have a music playlist from every year. Like it was so funny during that time. It was like fight song and all the, like take back my life and all these, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And now it's like all love and joy and all that <laughs> stuff um, after six years. But um but I, I had the kind of a break, uh, breakdown, breakthrough, I would say. And when a, a dog had bit me and it changed my life and I realized like, this is not what I want to be doing. So then I started, my first step was the walking. The walking. Yeah. And do you still do that? Do you mm -hmm. still, you still I just do walked the walk? to the beach this morning. Really? Yeah, I do. I do wow. almost every, really every miles? morning. How many miles would you say you walk? Um, this morning I walked about four miles, but wow. usually I walk about two and a half miles. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's every morning. And do you... Uh, I, do you still dance? I, I, do you still ha do yeah. your dancing? Yeah. In, in the beach? I do. I do. And when I manifested, um, I, I wrote my manifestation letter of who I, the love of my life, who actually came in about a, seven months after I wrote the letter to myself. Um, he's a great dancer. And so yeah. we just started, we took salsa lessons. Oh, okay. He's much better than I am. And I, and, and I always just want to kiss him. So I, I, I'm not getting far in my dancing with him, but, um, I dance at the lifeguard stand. Yeah. There's a beautiful picture. On, we're going to show this uh, from your Instagram page. I think it's of you and your partner kissing at the lifeguard stand. Yeah, that's our lifeguard stand. That's, that's beautiful. Where I dance. <laughs> that's yeah, beautiful. That's where I dance. He's, he's amazing. Oh. He's a trauma surgeon, so he came in and healed my trauma. So helped really? me heal it. Yeah. yeah. He's now doing uh, somatic healing. No, he he's in the psychedelic world. Psychedelic world. So, yeah. So he's doing trauma healing through psychedelics. Yeah. That's fascinating. Which is, he's incredible. You should have him on next. He's, that's, he's in it. That's yeah. incredible. So he went from being a trauma surgeon to he's now doing psychedelic healing. Trauma. Yeah. Wow. Healing trauma. Healing because trauma. the thing is, is that when when we first started, he I actually did use psychedelics for a lot of healing over years, about 10 years of healing of um, some childhood trauma. And when I met him, I told him about it. And he's sober and like completely smart. Like he was so, he was so fascinating. He's like, wait, you're healing your does this really work? And I think that for a while he couldn't believe that it really worked. And then he started to see it in me, obviously me, he saw it, but also started doing all the research on it. And it's, there's an incredible, incredible of, yes. I mean, yeah. John Hopkins is yeah. doing incredible, I mean, research. he's in the maps program. So he's is in he really? all those, he's so, yes. in all those programs. Yeah. So yeah. what, um, would you care to talk about just what the psychedelic healing, like what the process looks like? Yeah, it's, I, yeah, sure. Um, it's all different for different types of people. Uh -huh. So I worked with somebody um, for years, this this uh, woman friend of mine, and she did like journey work mm -hmm. of like going into deep. And it, basically what it does for me, what it did, I would say is it takes all the noises out of your head and you're like, like, who am I? Who is my true being? Mm -hmm. And every time I do the work, it's like, I just have to be myself, right? Like, I just want to be Tammy. Like I, mm -hmm. I, we complicate our life with all of this. I should be doing this and this person and then this, and then all these little voices go on in your head and they're like fighting up there. It's like a sorority, like having a screaming mm -hmm. match at each other. Right. But the reality is like, we all just like want to be like who we are, like our true essence of ourselves. Yeah. And so it helps you get to that and like helps guide you on how you're going to do it. Like a lot of like, I'm working right now, most recently on boundary work. And I want to only be with people that I feel really good with and comfortable with. And I used to, like, I have some people in my life that like would yell at me and bully me. And I don't want to be that way. Cause if I'm with them, I turn it the other way. So it's like really like every time I do the work, I 
dig deeper and deeper and I learn more and more about myself and about tools that I need to Well, you talk about grow. how um like you weren't the tiger. You were you were, you know, there was a time at your life where you were not like you were more the tiger rather than just the cub, rather than just mm -hmm. going, you know, you were a fear-based leader versus yes. a love-based leader. Yeah. So something like this the psychedelic journey could help people kind of transform themselves from a fear-based leader to a love-based leader. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's actually what, what ended, what happened. Right. So I did, I did, I mean, I was in Peru. I did, you name it, I've done it. And I did it because I didn't like myself and I wasn't myself. And so I, and I didn't like being, like I didn't like being a tiger. I, you know, I, I, I mean, that type of a fear-based tiger. And it wasn't right for my employees, and I didn't want to be that way. And so the shift came, like, through me, and I knew that I was the leader of the company. So if I'm shifting, then I allow everyone else to shift as well. Mm -hmm. So if they see me in, like, I mean, my my relationship now is the most beautiful co-creation of love. Like, people stop us and I'm like, oh, my God, because we literally are co-creating it together consciously every day. And now it's like all of the people that work for me, all of my, not only my, my work family, but like my clients and all of that, it's like seeing that and getting glimpses of that, that gives everyone the opportunity, like I can do that too, right? Mm -hmm. I can be in that type of loving, caring relationship too. And I think that's really important. But it wasn't that start, it wasn't that way. It was was What was the tri catalyst. tipping point? The catalyst. Yes. Um, well, everything in my life is literal. Like when I met, John is a trauma surgeon, like killing my trauma in on an airplane on United Airlines. I'm like, everything is literal. So my ex-husband brought a dog home. His name was Bob. We had this kind of thing about it. I thought we should get a doodle because we had four kids. Anyway, uh, Bob bit me in my eye here. And um, I was like, holy crap. And the dog, he was, it was a bait dog that it would been beat up and it was aggressive, right? And I'm like, this dog is me had been beat up and aggressive in life, right? So I was like, oh my God, this, and then I realized that this, that God or spirit, I call it spirit, whatever it was like, literally the I thing was like to wake up, wake up, this is your life. And there was a couple other things that had happened in threes right then. And I was like, I was not living my best life. So, and I'm, I'll never forget this friend of mine came over and she goes, and I'm crying and she goes, Oh, girl, you have just hit rock bottom. And I'm like, oh, God, what am I doing? And then the next day, um, I asked my husband at the time to take the dog back. And he's like, I'm busy. I'm too busy at work. And I'm like, what? Well, this is over, too. Like, this is just over for everyone here, you know? And so that dog, Bob, gave me the biggest gift because it literally was like, I am done and I need to do this. I need to figure out me. And how, because it, it was important for me too, is to show my kids, like, I'm like, that. I'm modeling them and I'm falling apart. Like, that is not mm -hmm. how I want to show up in these kids' lives. I love the fact that you could see the symbolism. You know, you were at least yeah. connected enough to be able to see the symbolism of what this dog represented. Yeah. It was you, the, you know, how just, you were angry. You were just yeah. lashing out. Yeah. And then it was also the symbolism of that moment of just, oh my God, my, my marriage is right. ending. But this dog, the bait dogs are caged. And I felt caged. Really? And you can't cage a tiger, yeah. right? Yeah. So then I was like, I got to get uncaged here. <laughs> I got to figure out how to do this. So I did. So what changes did you do in the work to make yourself the leader you wanted to be? What did you do? I think that I got really like, there. I did a lot of work. Like I obviously did the the psychedelic work. I went to Hoffman, mm -hmm. which is the Hoffman process, which is a life-changing mm -hmm. process. I started doing a lot of self care. Um, and I also just like started like being really real with people. Like, and I started just, I think for me, really loving myself was the biggest thing. I know that sounds so cliche because we, we all talk about it, but like if you really, if you don't love yourself, like I didn't love myself when I was yelling and like a fear based leader. And I was like, I want to like really love myself. So one of the things that is important to me, it's always been important. And that's why people love me even when I was a little scarier. I love to play. Like I am, mm -hmm. if there's one thing I match is the last name and thank you for my ex for, you know, that was not my last name. That is his name. But now it's my name with my children's and it's a party. Like yeah. I am, 
I'm the goddess of love and play. Like I, I am like, I, I'll play any card game or any of those, but I like to dance. I like to party. I like to bring me music. I mean, every music festival I'm going to this weekend, we're going to we're jazz fest. And then we're going to Garth Brooks. I love Garth Brooks. Oh, I love Garth Brooks. I know that. a Texas girl. I and John yes. always gets me tickets. So we follow him around. I it's my him. birth. It's my present. So, you know, I think that there's got to be a core of something that you're like, what is my core? Yeah. I am playful and loving. And that's what I want to get back to. So. And I love how you talk about how you have these parties for your employees, yeah. these Easter parties, these I, praying for snow parties. Yeah. I mean, it's like it is not just something it, it doesn't seem like something that, oh, I just have to do this because I have to keep my workforce happy. But it's truly who you are. I mean, right. you'd love to play and to have fun. It's, it's the dance. It's like you yeah. love to go and just dance and just. Yeah. That's beautiful. I was just talking to my right hand and I was like, we have to have a, we have to have a summer party. We're going to have, we're going to get this band because we have this karaoke, we have some really good singers in my company. So I'm like, there's a karaoke band and we're going to get them and everyone's going to karaoke and we're going to dance. And so that's already getting planned for summer. So, Do you think that love of just having fun and wanting to party and just celebrating life came from your realization that you're diagnosed you when you when you're diagnosed with ms you wouldn't you don't know what the future holds none of us do but it, right. in, in, in you it just you that we, was a scary moment <laughs> so like oh my lord what is i mean it's such moment. a heavy it's such a yeah. heavy realization so it's almost like you needed the light the play the fun to balance out this very heaviness yeah i mean actually i think i was born with the love and the play. Actually, I that was my essence actually. I actually that was who I was. I think through the years, I think that you know, I had some I had a lot of trauma as a child. I think that um I got smaller and smaller, you know. I think when I got diagnosed with the MS, I think the MS was a manifestation of undealt with trauma actually mm -hmm. because it's caged me, if you will, or could have. And this was 20 years ago. There wasn't really a lot you could do about it at that time. Now there's a lot, thank God. So it's a one, you know, it's the, all the medical advances are wonderful. Um, but I was really scared when I got diagnosed with MS and I did take about a year and a half off and I just did some, I did a lot of, I started meditating. I did a lot of healing then, but I didn't really know what I was doing, I would say. Um, but it was, it's, it's when you get diagnosed, it's scary yeah. and you do want to live your best life. I just didn't know how to, how to live my best life then, you know? So, and that's the thing is, is back then I didn't know how to like talk to people or like, like um, have emotional conversations. I didn't feel safe having them like I do now. And I didn't have the tools like I do now. And, um, and I wish I would have, you know, I wish I would have known like, how to have those conversations, those more intimate conversations. You mentioned you started doing meditating really after that. Yeah. After you realize that, like, what does meditation look like to you? Do you do it every morning, every... So like, how does it was it interesting because I just did things. I kind of followed a protocol then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think I knew I was doing meditation, <laughs> but I was doing guided meditation. Um, and basically taking the MS as like little um, cells. So I would like imagine them like dissipating in my mind, which has been amazing because I actually have I'm a pretty benign case of MS. So I did that for years. And then really up until I, I my walk was more my meditation, I would say. And then during COVID, I ruptured my Achilles. So I know playing flag football with the kids. Yeah, oh, I love to man. play. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm in volleyball. I'm doing volleyball. <laughs> I mean, I'm like every, you name it, I'll play it. I'm terrible at flag football though. <laughs> I'm like, obviously, but, um, anyway, so I started TM meditation and that, mm -hmm. that actually is very, to me, what I do now, what I need to go in really deep, very quickly. And I, I love that type of meditation. No, I love it too. For me, that yeah. has been, I mean, a huge, yeah. just breakthrough in my life is just the, the, the transcendental meditation. And it really became yeah. Like I have my own little prayer now. I try to do every morning. It means something very different, but it's the same prayer. Yeah. But yeah. it's every, it's different. And it's just, if I can, if I can start my day off meditating with like some sun, getting some sun on me, right? it's, it changes the whole day. If yeah. I don't have the meditation, I totally realize like, this is just, my day is a little bit off. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think oh, that so good. meditation is so important. Yes. Um, how has MS compromised 
your day-to-day -day activities. That's great that it's just a benign case, but. Um, you know, it's, it just, I think it puts me in awareness of, of mm -hmm. everything. I think if anything I did when I got diagnosed, you know, it was really difficult, but I did realize I'm like, this is my one life, right? So I'm going to live it. And I think in that way, it catapulted me into a lot of things, which I think was a good thing. Um, you know, sometimes I'm like, you know, things will happen. I'm like, I wonder if that's my MS. So it is a little mm -hmm. bit, um, stabilizing, you know, mm -hmm. I do feel like I do meet people with MS and I, and new people that are diagnosed and I like to talk to them and help them and have them see that I was able to have four kids and live a normal life and do all these things. Cause I think that's important is shifting your mind that this isn't like, oh my gosh, you're going to be, you know, like, what does this mean for people? Um, so I like to help anyone that's what, been diagnosed. Are there things that you just do not take for granted anymore? I mean, time, I think I, I try to be as present as I can and I don't want to spin out in something and be like, you know, standing in a corner and wasting my, my time really. Right. Because that's not good. Right. I also, as part of the preparation for this interview, I read that MS made you really want to, you know, build a career where you can make money huh. so that you wouldn't, your family wouldn't have to pay. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting in a weird sort of way how that is what drove you to try to build a very successful career, not having to rely on your family to take care of you, but rather to have, uh, just to pay, be able to pay for that. Yeah. That was one of them. Yeah, it did. It was a dry, for sure. I, I wanted to be successful on my own. I didn't want to have to marry a rich man or anything like that to live. I didn't want my family to have to wipe my bottom or any of that. If, if my MS got, bad, which was a driver very quickly. And that's why I think because I became successful so quickly, but I also wanted to be successful in my own right as a woman. And my dad really did prep me for that. Like he didn't go, oh, you're a woman or a man. Like it was never that. It was like, I was just mm -hmm. a, his person, his, his, you know, a person to him that can do anything. Yeah. Tiger, right? Yeah. Not a man or a woman, just a tiger. But it's also like, you know, fear is a powerful motivator. I yeah. mean, it is. I mean, yeah. and, 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 and it's not sometimes these things happen to us and we, the fear, you know, of, oh my God, like I have, who's going to take care of me? That is a powerful motivator, yeah. but just because I might be a powerful motivator at that time, yeah. like doesn't mean that you can, you know, you can change what motivates you. You can change what drives you. Right. It doesn't mean that it's not good right there. I mean, I, many of us have had situations where trauma in our own lives, where the fear, the pain the loss is what drove us and then we get to a place and i'm like okay now we can go right you know use something else to drive us now to the next phase of our lives right it definitely drove me the ms definitely 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 drove me you talk about how you created vision boards yeah i still do <laughs> tell me what a vision board looks like so that's part of my life change warriors, but, um i can tell you so for me i manifest i i'm a big manifester and i I don't even like the word manifesting because it sounds so woo-woo in a way, but I always write out my life. I'm like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Like, this is what's from a hundred year old goddess mm -hmm. of myself. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, you're in your forties and you did this, da, da, da. You're in the, this is how you're going to live your life. So it starts with a letter to myself from my okay. older self. Okay. So the hundred year old goddess, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so like what already yeah. happened to me. Yeah. So it's like when I manifested, like literally John, I was like, we have six kids. We have a lake house. It's 4th of July. We're drinking rosé. The only thing is he doesn't drink. We're dancing together. Mm -hmm. And we have our boat. And literally, three years later, after I wrote that, I didn't even meet him. I, I met him. We had our lake house. We had our boat. It was the 4th of July. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, my God. We're, like, literally living my letter. So That's when incredible. I do a vision board, I start with a letter of what I want. Uh -huh. Then I take out. And then I go ahead and I put it in, like, five different categories. It's, like myself, my family, my work, my love, and my fr my friends, and then also my community. Sorry, my community in there too. So I basically take all these things and I do magazines and then I write my goals. Like if it's like, for instance, I wanted to go to Cuba. I wanted, so I wanted to actually take my daughter on a trip for her 18th birthday. So give my daughter a trip, plan the trip. You know, we went, we ended up going to Cuba is where we went. But just like little things, like you could do business, you could say like, I want to, um, you know, like I want to do a billion dollars this year in, in real estate. 
And so how am I going to do that? So I put like just the little steps in there on how mm-hmm. to do it. And it, it works. And I, I teach that. That's my life change warrior That's the class. Life change warrior. That's what we do with the homeless women too. And theirs is like, I want to get my GED, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and we do it with them. And I'm like, okay, what are the steps to get the GED? And they go through them. And out of our, our graduating class one year, six of them didn't have their GED. They all put it in their board and six of them got That's their GED. Great. Well, I love what you said about the Life Change Warriors Foundation is that you don't want to just give people money, but you want to teach people how to fish. Right. Exactly. You want to have them, like, and that in right. the vision board is part of doing that. Yeah. So it's like a 15-hour program. It's about a 15-hour. And it okay. starts with their lifeline because I okay. think that the lifelines are really important mm-hmm. because everyone has a life story and that really does um, affect every everyone. But when you're in a group setting and then you realize like other people, like there's a lot of, you know, people that were molested in there and mm-hmm. they're like, oh, wait, you were molested. And, and I was actually molested as a child, too. So with these women, mm-hmm. most of them in the homeless um, shelters are, were. So there's a relational thing. And they're like, wait, you were and you did all this. I'm like, yeah, and you can do it, too. So let's like let's figure out how we can do this, you know, together yeah. because we're there to support each other. Right. Yeah. And so. um so yeah, I, I love, I, so, but we start with their, their lifeline in that. And then we go through some present work of like, this is, you're okay. We're worthy. You're loved. You're lovable. We got this. And then we create from there. So I love that. Yeah. What is, what does a warrior mean to you? A warrior means somebody that, um, actually goes for what they want, but is also flexible, flexible and can pivot when needed and that follows their heart. And really is their true essence of who they are. I remember in my research, I read that you wanted to be like, your goal was to be this down to earth, life life changing warrior. warrior. Yeah. And that's how the foundation started. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I feel like I am that in, it's funny because I, I I don't like the term real estate agent. I think it just has such a terrible connotation. And so we were on a company retreat and I'm like, let's rename what we are. And so we renamed us into Life Change Warriors because we help people change their lives in real estate, like through mm-hmm. homes, because mm-hmm. that's a life changing event for it people. It totally is. Yeah. And and speaking to that life changing event of people, it's something that you being in the real estate space, you you know that buying a home in Los Angeles is not feasible today like it was 20 years ago. Statistically, right. the vast majority of people will never be able to afford a home. Mm-hmm. If an average person today wanted to buy a home, mm-hmm. like how could they make that happen? How could a young, upwardly mobile, educated professional in Los Angeles mm-hmm. work their way to buy a home when it's become so expensive? I always say, this is what I, because I work with a lot of first-time home buyers. I mean, you have to get in the market because the problem with the market in Los Angeles is it kind of, it moves very quickly, right? So what I usually do is I try to get them into areas that aren't aren't moving as, or, well, that haven't moved so quickly. So like maybe, well, you know, Inglewood, Baldwin Hills, different areas, West Adams, you know, all of those um, used to be Venice. It depends on where you are. Mm-hmm. But just get, I don't care if you buy one bedroom condo, get in the market and then know that it's going to take a few moves for you to get to where you want to be, right? So, and I always encourage people to obviously start their savings. A lot of times parents will help them, you know, put a down payment. I mean, the reality is in Los Angeles, there's a housing, major housing shortage. And that's why things are so expensive because they have not allowed more and more housing, which I get the complications of that, but there needs to be more housing because with limited supply, the prices go right. too high. They just right. do. And also the prices of home are going up, but the median income of people working here is kind of staying the same. There's just a lot of income inequality. Right. I mean, I so agree. how do you think just our society can address that? Is is it? I mean, that's that's for the political forefront, which I hope... <laughs> like starts paying attention to this, right? I used to build affordable housing when I was um, getting my MBA actually. And I do think that there's some affordability that needs to be considered. I would do families and we did um, seniors. Mm -hmm. And I see that being the biggest gap where it's like really difficult, you know? Um, I do think that there needs to be a lot more attention on that. And attention also on the spending because there have been huge bills that 
came in, you know, mm-hmm. billion dollar bills, but then it, the cost to build is, I don't know, $700 a foot they're putting on this affordable housing. And it's, right. it's just not, it just doesn't make sense right now. So since most of your work is focused in residential real mm-hmm. estate, uh, the zoning of properties, mm-hmm. I'm sure affects that. And I've read that there's a lot of zoning, uh, just p- bills to push change the zoning of residential properties right. rather than like a single family home could possibly be turned into a home that maybe has seven units. Mm-hmm. How do you where do you think that's an answer you know to address the housing crisis or affordability? But then about, by doing that, it does change the dynamic of other single family homes and neighborhoods. Yeah, I think there's going to be areas like more corridor areas that that needs to happen. I think what you need to what we need to do is redefine redefine our conversation about a neighbor as well. Like I I find it interesting where people are like, oh, I don't want that, I don't want that, you know. And I like in residential neighborhoods, I get that, right? I get that they're not, you know, you don't want a house and then seven units, mm. but you could definitely do it on a major street. You know what I mean? Have a little bit, have more, have more housing on those streets. And there's also like housing that we could be doing in different areas, you know, mm-hmm. that I think hasn't been seen. So I haven't been doing as much research on that. Um, but I definitely think that, you know, I think I want ever, I would like like micro units, you know, smaller units and yeah. having some of these like little 500 square foot, uh, tiny houses, Yeah, you know, could be something that it could, could be. be it's a way, it's a, it's a way yeah. for people to at least get into, you know, yeah. if they want to live, let's say in Venice yeah. and they want to. Uh, they work in Venice, they live in Venice, they might have to sacrifice you know, space in order yeah. to live in the neighborhood they want. Yeah. I work out at Gold's Gym. Oh, you do? Yes, yes, yes yeah. I do. And I, I love working out there. And one of the things that just breaks my heart when I drive by oh, there is seeing just all the homeless tents right in front of the Google building, right in front of the Gold's Gym building. How, you know, what do you... Knowing that you're selling, you know, real estate, and you mm-hmm. see this, I mean, you you must see just the homelessness next to these mm-hmm. million dollar homes that mm-hmm. you're selling. Like, what is the solution? Having the, you know, some housing in Venice for these people. Is I mean, there I something don't. Else? I don't know what the solution is. I, what I know is what is happening is not fair to them, anyone, mm-hmm. and. This is America, right? So it's like, let's take care of, like, let's figure this out. I don't think the government, um, I don't, I I don't think what they've been doing is, it's obviously not effective, right? Um, And I don't think it's good for anyone at all. You know what I mean? So I think that there's got to be a lot of work that happens on that. Hmm. I don't know the solution. I do know when I built affordable housing, I built over 500 units the way we did it worked, but they got rid of the redevelopment years ago. So I don't know. But it goes back to also community. What you talk about, mm-hmm. just focusing on compute community, you make that a big part of just what your manifestation letter is that it's not just if you, if you know, a home is not just about, you know, those four walls. It's right. about your community. And if you right. want your community to thrive, you also have to, you know, yeah. as your grandfather said, give I mean, back to your farm. You that's know, why, give, that's why I farm. give so much back to my farm. I mm-hmm. mean, I've given over a million and a half dollars back to my farm. And that's why I work with homeless women to be like, okay, let's get you up. You know what I mean? Let's mm-hmm. figure out a better way to do this and get and I mean, they actually, it's funny because some of them have gotten jobs at the affordable housing places that I told you about really? and I'm like and the, you know she has a, a, so like one of them and it's interesting because after I teach this class to them they do get on their feet and then I like one of them saw I saw at the grocery store with her daughter and I'm like she's like oh my god you changed my life I got a job I got the I'm like oh thank god you know so I don't know what the solution is I I would like there to be a solution obviously um but for me my solution of what I'm trying to do is you're building teaching, your community. Teaching them. Yeah, yeah, teaching and helping. And and I do give them um, money when we're done with the program to go for their rent for the first few months. I think you probably know that. Right. Though. And I also read that for every sale you make, there's a portion of that that's mm-hmm. given back to the charity. Yeah. Of- it's not of the client's choice. It actually goes into the different charities that are mm-hmm. local. Because I was giving 
money to cat charities in Virginia, which I have nothing, <laughs> no problem with cat charities. It's just that when they're in Virginia, I'm like, well, I'm trying to work on our community, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. When between balancing the work of the community, these major issues of just, you know, the, the addressing real estate needs for your clients, mm -hmm. you also are a mother of four. And now, a, you know, you have a blended family yeah, of six. six, a blended family of six. <laughs> yeah. You have a fiance. You're running yeah. a multi-million dollar business. What does balance mean to you? Like, how are you trying to balance all of it? Because they're all very different priorities. They need different sides of Tammy. Mm -hmm. They need, um, like, the, your children require different things from you from your employees. Right. Well, and then your partner and your partner. Yeah, my partner definitely. But sometimes my, my they can the work family and the home family can be the same. Um, you know, for me, it's about quality time. So mm -hmm. I like I take golf lessons with my son Jack. I'm mm -hmm. not a golfer, but he we call him Country Club Jack. <laughs> I mean, it's all at the public golf courses and stuff. Um, but I try to like I, I try to see what they are passionate about and then do that with them. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, for the kids, it's really quality time. I. I don't have that, you know, I have them, I have them certain days. So on those days I don't work after, so I'm picking them up and I take them and I, you know, those, that's very important to me. Mm. Um, and it's just the moments, like we just yeah. went on a sailing trip and I was like no devices. And that's so we wonderful. sat with no device and it was awesome. That's wonderful. And, yeah. and in my research, I read that you don't start your, you don't check your email, mm -mm. you don't check your phone, you don't check media until after your walk, until after 10 a.m. Yeah. I think that's such a great practice. It's just setting boundaries. Yes. Yes. So and it's great for my brain too, because it gives my, yes. it gives my, just, I decompress. I like set my intention for the day. I know what's like, I'm like, okay. So is that part of just your own way of balance in your life? Is, is talk about the boundaries. You've talked about boundaries as a new way you're, you know, you're working through is like, that's part of love too, is creating boundaries. Right. Boundaries. <laughs> when I first learned about boundaries in Hoffman, I was like, boundaries, what, what's a boundary? I had no idea. Uh -huh. And it, and right now I'm working on them pretty heavily because I realize how important they are. Um, and I realized that I had some in place, which was mm -hmm. this 10 a.m. It was a boundary. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't call it a boundary, but I was like, oh, that makes me feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that like what I'm accepting and not accepting for the people like I, there are certain things like I with my love, my partner and my love of my life, John, when I met him, I was like, listen, I'm like, these are my it wasn't a boundary. I would call it a requirement. So I think there's requirements and there's boundaries to me. Like there's boundaries where it's like, no, nope, we're going to stop here. Okay. Or this is where I'm comfortable going. But there's also requirements that I have. So like for me, my requirement for the, for my love, which um, is, I was like, I need complete, you know, I was so, I want complete transparency. Like if something like, I just want to like, no, like I want to know what happens or not happens. And this is when we were dating. I'm like, so mm -hmm. we were like, if you're sleeping with someone else, I want to know. So that I can make an informed decision mm -hmm. of what we're doing. Um, physical touch, not just sexual touch, physical touch was important. And I'm like, you can never yell at me. And this is right when we first started dating, like four weeks in. I said, listen, I need to tell you my requirements and see if you're okay with them. Because if you're good with them, we can keep dating. But if not, then I can't date you. Like we're not, this isn't That's so great out. that you actually knew what they were for right. you and you were able to say that. That is, yeah. a, that's great. Yeah, let me be clear. I took the Quinn Essentials, Andrea Quinn's <laughs> class, who's amazing. Definitely take that class. And she, I had just come off the really? class for the weekend. I was like, okay. Like, and okay. I was sweating. Really? I was like fully <laughs> sweating to tell him. And I'm like, um, I have to talk to you about something. And he's like, what? I'm like, I'm like, well, I have these requirements that I, cause I was just sick of wasting time yeah. and like making, minimizing yeah. myself. So I said that. And then he was like, I can do that. And so what I realized, even with my friendships and I don't sit there and say, these are my requirements of, of my friendships, but I re realized that the requirements of my friendships are very much the same mm -hmm. of the transparency of, of feeling comfortable that I'm not going to get yelled at. Right. And so I realized that those, I have boundaries and I have requirements. Okay. But life. on that transparency, like and what would have happened if he did say when you first started dating, yeah, I am maybe seeing somebody else. I mean, that's sometimes. You don't know? you want to know that? I, I mean, don't yes. you want to know? Oh my like, God. I don't do, know. I, know I, I, well, <laughs> I wanted to know because if he was seeing somebody then, and I didn't know, mm. and I kept, fell more and more for him. Mm -hmm. Right. 
then it's like this big surprise. And then it's like a lot. Then I feel like he's lying. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And what actually ended up happening is I saw somebody else because I didn't think he was. I thought he liked me, but I didn't think he was that interested in me. But because this, the requirements go both ways, by the way, mm -hmm. like it's that's trans, good. right. Yes, it's not like good. he's just transparent and I'm like sitting there. So I actually was with somebody else. And I said to him, I said, listen, I said, I promise you transparency. I was with somebody else. Um, you know, I got to be honest with you. It didn't feel right because I feel like I should be with you, but we're not, we weren't exclusive or anything. And that actually shifted our entire relationship. He was like, uh, what? <laughs> and I was like, uh, I don't, yeah, I told we're transparent. And he was like, no, that's not what I want. And I was like, well, then let's talk about that. Right. And then we shifted and then we've been together really together ever. And we were really together from the first time we met, but that really yeah. shifted and yeah. having that incredible, like honest, like just real yeah. honest conversation. And women don't do that. That's the thing. It's like, I, I was sitting there with somebody the other day. I'm like, why are we so scared to say what we want? Like mm -hmm. if we can't just tell people like, this is what I want. This is how I feel whole. Right. It's like, then they're just going to run us over all the time because they don't mm -hmm. even know. Yeah. It's like, nobody's a mind reader. Right? right. Right. So we expect these people to read our minds, but that can't be the case, you know? So, but you have to know what you want too. You know, it starts yeah. with knowing what you right. want. Too. Right. And, and, and that's what I did a lot of work around my second time around. Mm -hmm. I was like, I am going to have the second time around. If I'm going to be with somebody, it's going to be like the most beautiful co-creation of love because that's what I wanted. I, I had seen it. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I took snippets from my life of things that I really love mm -hmm. and actually of love, to be honest with you. It was started with my neighbors, Bonnie and Bob Schleeman. And then it was this Laura and David Hertz's wedding. I'll never forget sitting at their wedding. I was with my ex-husband um, and I was bawling because I could see their love. I could just, you could see, you, you could feel, feel it. it. You can feel it. And I'm like, oh my God, I want that. And he was sick. He got sick to his stomach and I was bawling. And I'm thinking, these are real signs here, you know? Oh, wow. And um, after that wedding, I realized that I could, that actually it, it existed, right? And there were other snippets of other relationships from my life. I was like, oh, they, they like really yeah, love each other. I know. And that's a beautiful thing to yeah, see. Yeah. And so, and so when I saw all of that, so I, when I became single again, I'm like, I'm not settling I'm never going to settle. Like I'm going to co-create to that level of how it reads to me. And that's what, that's what we have done. It's, it's, it's the most incredible, it's the most incredible thing. Ever. I also love that you also demanded a requirement of yeah. mine is not just sexual intimacy, not sexual touching, but physical touching. Yeah. You know, that's really important to me too. It's like the, you know, the five languages of yeah. love. That's, that's my love language. Yes. Physical yeah. touch and quality time are very much my right. languages of love. And, and it is, dip, sexual touch is very different than physical totally. touch. Totally. And knowing that you said that to him, like, I want that, like, that's really important to me is a lot of self-awareness on your part too. But it's also like saying, this is such an important part. Like if I don't have that, yeah. it's like, it's like, it's not a relationship. Yeah, exactly. And that was, and I did all the work, the five languages of love, at, you know, when I was divorced and it was interesting because my, first, he didn't like physical touch. I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. Really, you know? really. So see, that's so interesting. Like before, so you didn't know that when maybe you were dating your, you know, ex-husband right. at and the I was time, young, right? Yeah. So it was kind of like, yeah. you you know, you're where you're, where you're at when you're right. supposed to be there. Right. You know, he didn't know either. He was, we were both unaware and that was right. okay. But this next time out, I'm like, oh no, I'm going to really hone in to what I what I want. And we laugh because now we, we cuddle and touch all like my That's kids are, my mom calls us. My mom was like, Oh my God, you're like an octopus. To me. <laughs> That's so like, beautiful. He got, he's, <laughs> he's tatted. And so uh -huh. he got this huge octopus on his arm. Oh, that's so beautiful. And we always cut like, I'm like, oh, the cuddle, the cuddle is real, babe. The cuddle is real. Like it's like, That's... it's so nurturing and it's so physical touch for it's, me, at least it's so yeah. healing. It's and you so know, healing. to see also like I, to see older people like just touching and in love oh my god yeah. that just makes my heart melt i remember yeah. i i waited tables in college and i remember seeing this couple that was probably in their 70s and they would always come like every two weeks they would come on this date to the steakhouse <laughs> and she there were these glamorous older couple and you could just see the love i mean yeah. it was so palpable mm. she would he would make her cry it was like a first date but they had been together for just like 30 oh. years and i was like that is what i want yeah 
That yeah. is so beautiful. Yeah. It How <laughs> it's 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 just like, but it's hard to get. It's hard to get, and it's hard well, to, it's, and it's hard to maintain. It's 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 actually not. It's it. Here's the thing: is like everyone when I met John, they're like, "Where did you find him?" I'm like, "Like IL six Home Depot." You know, <laughs> you're not finding it you're not getting you really it. found you're... him at home depot no i i, I met him on an airplane <laughs> oh I, an airplane. I met him on an airplane wow and we did an emergency landing in grand junction because it's all literal for me oh. like united airlines grand junction i'm like oh wow. my god trauma surgeon i was like okay but we consciously co-created our love so he was a- awake enough right because mm-hmm. you meet at the you'll meet your partner at the level you're at and i mm-hmm. was awake and when we met we literally talk about like our love like we're like okay and he's like his is his love language is um words of affirmation so that's really important so we actually had put aside time to like talk at night because mm-hmm. that's important for mm-hmm. him you know what i mean and it's like everything is very very extremely conscious and consciously mm-hmm. co-creating so i think that it's it's not as difficult as everyone thinks it is mm-hmm. if you have an open dialogue with your partner and you have the, the openness. And then it's like the spiritual partnership is like even making love is a totally different out of this world thing. So how do you maintain that intimacy, though, after being together for how many years have you? Have We've been together a little over four years four now. Four years. OK. You have six children between uh-huh. the, your two families. Mm-hmm. You're running this just just multi, you know, it's a billion dollar business. Right. And he has his his business right. is through the, his healing journey. So you both are, you know, you have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of priorities. How do you make time to maintain intimacy between the two of you? We do a lot of things. Like we play, we play together. Uh-huh. I mean, we play a lot. Like okay, we, we laugh important. a lot. We cook together. Uh-huh. We make sure we have our time together. We go out to dinner at least once a week together. Mm-hmm. We always go to the same place. Um, but it's really like like nurturing ourselves like for instance like I'll sit at home and he'll like rub my feet we have these two rocking chairs in our house that um we'll just sit out and I light all the candles at night I always light candles at night and that's like our time he'll have this kombucha and I'll have my glass of wine and Mm -hmm. we talk we talk about everything even the hard things if I did something or if he did something that made we call them um, misfires. Mm-hmm. We're like, misfires. okay. Misfires, I yeah. love that. We got that from Laura Doss. Thank you. <laughs> and if something happened, we call it, instead of it's like, oh my God, I'm so angry at you and not talking about it. Like, it'll, he'll be like, I'll be like, we don't, like if I misfired, I'm like, you know what? I just want to own my misfire today. I did this and I know mm-hmm. that made you feel uncomfortable. And I'm sorry I was in this state and that wasn't okay. That's really nice. Yeah. You actually have this opportunity to like, Hey, like we have misfires knowing that you're, you're human. You may, yeah, you know, you make okay. mistakes. Sometimes you, it, you're busy, but you both maybe can you do something, say something, right. act away. And then you can say, Hey, listen, I misfired. That's a, yeah. What a beautiful way yeah. of just saying that. Yeah. And we actually are in, um, well, we didn't realize we were in couples therapy, but we were working with this, this shadow work, this lady, mm-hmm. And she had us both come in. And so we started doing like couples therapy with her once a month, which we really didn't realize. I'm like, I think we're in couples therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we maintain that because even when we're in a great place, which we, it's like, it's important to literally work on your relationship. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it does take somebody else to sit there and, and she knows us both very well now. And just to kind of always have it an open dialogue. So, yeah. To your kids and physical touch with your kids and play, one of the things I read that just touched my heart was when you said how you do these foot rubs at night mm-hmm. with the kids. And they fight, actually. They yeah. they are they fight amongst each other to see who's going to get the first foot rub with mom. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. did that start? Um, <laughs> thank you. I, I see you have all your angels out there that, like, uh-huh. help you through these things. And it's true. It's like all of it is from snippets from other people. It's mm-hmm. like... My friend, one of my, my soul sisters, Lizanne, who I met at Hoffman, when I got divorced, I was like, I want to like connect with my kids more. Like, I feel like I'm not connecting with them. I don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I really didn't know how to do it because I was, mm-hmm. you know, um, and she goes, get lavender oil and go in there and rub their feet. Because mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to them about this, like the divorce and like, mm-hmm. and like see if they would, you know, kind of have them be able to talk. Right. And um, so I started doing it. I thought they thought I was going to be 
nuts doing it. They were like, oh, this is awesome. Like it was, it's been life changing for us all. And now of course they're like, okay, now on my back actually. Like, so now they all have different things. Like some of them are like, no, no, no. I'm foot rub mom. No, I want to no. do my head or my sh- shoulders, shoulders <laughs> which is do totally my back. fine. I want a deep tissue yeah, for massage. Like, <laughs> um, but it just, it's really brought us um, a lot closer. So that's been, that's been, I would, if I could encourage any young mom at it, even a young, I wish I would have started a much younger with all of them. That's one of the most, just, it's like time. It's like, what's yeah. going on with you? You know, yeah. right? and you don't have to talk or they could read you a book or, you know, sometimes one of my sons doesn't like to talk. I'm like, why don't you read me a couple of pages of your favorite book? And we'll just sit here and, you know, or not So that's what you what do. You'll just it. rub his feet and then he'll read, you know, mm-hmm. he'll read the book. Yeah. He doesn't really like to talk that much. So uh-huh. that's kind of our connection point. Yeah. yeah. He's the golf. He's the He's, country that's club. How, that's how, yeah. I love the, how you found, you adapted yourself a little bit to connect with their different personalities. Yeah. Because like some kids are more vocal, others are, you know, more physical, but then, you know, other people want to do activities and that's how you connect. Right. It's all, mm-hmm. connection is, that's been the interesting thing with all six of the kids because it's like they're all different connectors. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. which kid am I with? And what do you like in your burrito? You know, it's like mm-hmm. they all like different ice, no ice, you know, all the, like different things. So it's keeping them all together on what they're, way of connection is and then you connecting with it as well did you have nannies helping you with yes you have to yeah i had so. um veronica she's been with me for 18 years wonderful she's like our family i mean she's you know and um she's like our family and and her she had two kids at the time and they came too so we, there's oh, even really? more of us yeah more of us yeah because it was important that she didn't like leave her kid at yeah. home well i she's taking care of my kids that's not fair yeah. you know so she, we just, we were like, but it is something it. that it's, it's, I've seen is that, you know, running a family is so hard. It's so much work to do. So having that help with oh. nanny or even family members or friends or na- yeah. neighbors, you know, yeah. even, you know, yeah. is, is, is so, so important. Yeah. I have a great, I have a great support team. I really, and I really care about them and I have a great support team. We're going to end with just uh, asking a few few okay. questions, um, short questions. What would you say are your top three healthiest habits? Um, my healthiest habits are yeah. my walk in the morning, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, I would actually say my walk in the morning, I would say um, I've been doing Pilates lately. And I think that's really good because it's strengthening no, me. No, Pilates actually. is great. Yeah, the studio, the yeah. Legree method. You do the actual machines, or do you yeah. do the mat Pilates? No, I do the, Leg- the Legree method. So I don't yeah. know if you've done that what kind. That? Oh, it's the hardest. Mm-hmm. So hard. Really, it's so hard. But it strengthens me. So I feel like that's really healthy for mm-hmm. my body. Um, and honestly, um, and I've been doing yoga. So those are probably my three okay. top things. I've been really enjoying that yeah a principle that i have is that part of balance is having healthy vices Mm -hmm. something that is like not good for you but that brings you great joy right what would you say are the top three vices that bring you great joy i mean i love shopping (laughs) i i love like getting i I just like yesterday i went and got some jeans i'm like oh just love it and i just got retail these shoes therapy, and like the, yeah so i would say retail therapy is way too much mm-hmm. but i do that um my other vices i love a glass of wine i do i love to sit there and have a glass of wine after like and just sit there and chat that's something mm-hmm. i love to do um, and does that does it how does john you know knowing that he's sober is does that he's he's you know he is the most incredible sober person because he's fine with it. He, he loves, and he always drives us and everything. So, mm-hmm. cause I would never, I'm not a, I'm never dangerous around anything like that. But, um, you know, it's interesting. His take on alcohol is like, I don't want it because I, he loves who he is without it. And, um, he's just shifted the narrative on mm-hmm. it really on like, I don't, why I, I don't want to be the person I am drinking. Mm-hmm. So it's like, he really is happy in his life. So he's like, I would never, why would I drink? Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Um, and I like that because it doesn't nice. feel this funny, yeah. weird, there's no weirdness and it's, there. And it's, it's nice that you can enjoy, you know, that vice and it's as long as you're not abusing it. You know, for me, it's food in many ways. You know, right. I love, 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 obsessed with food, but it's like you can't 
as long as you know just you know you know your limits yeah yeah that would be good and then um this is funny but i'm pretty much vegan i'm more like pegan but <laughs> what is pegan i think it's well i, I think you made <laughs> it, it up fish? actually to be honest with you but it's fish uh-huh it's fish and no fish and then you're vegan besides that okay oh, okay basically. so is it a pescatarian or no because pescatarian... no because that would get have dairy in okay it. okay okay and do you feel really just healthier cleaner well i mean i kind of did it because john's actually vegan okay. and he's a good cook and i'm a terrible okay. chef so he it, we kind of did it because of, i mean mm-hmm. i didn't do it but he, i just kind of naturally kind mm-hmm. of saw myself step into that um except I just love cheese. So I just like, and I'll eat it. You're a vegan, except for like, but then occasional I get cheese. like, because, it, because then it actually makes me sick. Really? Like I actually physically So your don't. body's actually telling you, you know, you're, you're, you like yeah, the taste like of I, it. Like I get really congested and, but it's like, wow. and every, I do it all the time. I'm like, and I go onto the airlines. Like if I go on the airlines mm-hmm. on Alaska, they have this cheese plate. And I'm like, he's like, you're doing it again. He's like, you're going to be sick in like two hours. I'm like, I know, but it's just so good right now. Like for five (laughs) minutes. And then I'm like, oh shit, I'm going to be so sick. And then I, yeah. That is how alcohol is for me. Like I can't, like I, I enjoy it, but it just gives me such headaches. I'm such a lightweight. Yeah. So (laughs) you're like, forget it. What am I doing this? Yeah. So I know this might seem dark, but a philosophy of mine is that what drives human nature Mm -hmm. is a combination of sex, money, and power. What are the three words that motivate you? Um, three words that motivate me. I would say connection motivates me. Love really, really motivates me. Um, I would say play. Like, I love to play and laugh. If I know I'm going to go have a good time and play and laugh, I am totally motivated and in that's so good that you allow that you know you allow the universe you know you you want to play that's so important because as we get older you know as we get older like we we have all the adult responsibilities like we almost like stop learning what it means to play and for kids it's so natural it's so easy but i've seen that it's just as we get you know as adults it's just it's a lot harder and you actually i've had to work harder at like learning how to play it's a weird yeah i have some friends like you and they that's why we're friends and i always say don't threaten me with a good time because i will take you up on it <laughs> anytime i'm like oh my god i'm like the first duck in every pond when you're we're gonna play i'm like wow what are we gonna do <laughs> i actually go by my my right hand and i go by our childhood names so my child mm-hmm. like it's not really a name it's like our like our spirit like our shadow's name, and which is Daisy, is mm-hmm. mine, mm-hmm. and hers is Adelaide. So we literally get in the car, like, "What's Adelaide doing?" Oh, Daisy, Daisy has to do it. And we laugh at each other because it's like, so we're we show and then we show up at our listings. We're like, "Hi, how are you?" Mm-hmm. And they're like, "You guys look like you're having a great day." We're like, we're thinking we're like our five year olds playing yeah. and we're, like, we're having a great day. That's incredible. So that's like the shadow part. Like that's a little girl yeah. inside of you. Like the I little have, girl is yeah, like the out little, there and she's happy yes. and she's seen and she's just like, oh. it's really. If I could encourage anyone to get in touch with their shadow and their inner child and and bring mm-hmm. them out to their like people, yeah. right? Well, you know, my mother's a Jungian therapist, so okay. a big part of what she does is work on just shadow work. Okay, but so you, a lot of the shadow yeah. work is like negative emotions. It's like what are the desires, the dark desires, mm-hmm. the things that are not socially acceptable. But part of also shadow work is the hidden, repressed child mm-hmm. that. You just push down that didn't grow up. And I think for me, that was a big part of it. Like my, you know, it's like I had to grow up very, very fast. So it's like I had to push down my childhood. Like my the, my little girl, I had to like, she had to do very adult things yeah. at a very young age. So so I didn't have a chance to, I wasn't like, I had to grow up very fast. So my little girl like had to, was like pushed down. And like as an adult, I actually had to really work through my own therapy and bringing that little girl in play like up. You right. know, so up to the name? surface. What's your name? Raquelita. Raquelita. Yes, oh, Raquelita. Yeah, Raquelita and Daisy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I think that's beautiful that, like, that. I love that, Raquelita. Raquelita, yeah. And it's Raquelita. It's, it's the Spanish. I grew up in Bolivia. So uh-huh. it's like the little girl, you know, yeah. is Raquelita. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> what are the very small things you do every day that bring you balance? I'm going to have to say walking. I 
walking. Um, it's interesting walking, sitting in the rocking chair at night. Like mm-hmm. I do that as my grandma's old rocking chair. I've gotten it recovered really? a thousand times. It's, it's your beautiful. grandmother's chair. Yeah. Uh. And now it's in crushed velvet. It's so pretty. And um, John has a chair. We feel like that. I'm like, are we like the little bears here? <laughs> They're chairs. <laughs> um, honestly, and just like talking like with John, like really like I love like honestly cuddling with John is probably one of the biggest things for me. It goes back to the physical touch, you yeah. know, just how like that brings you balance. Just that. Yeah. I get a little off. It's funny when we're not together at nights, so, you know, like he'll travel mm-hmm. and he'll travel and it's weird. It's like we're both like, oh, that and we both never sleep well, like ever. We're really? both. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's love. I know, so that good. really it's so good. is love. It's so good. What does wealth mean to you? I think wealth is really when you're like, to me, it's not really money. It's more feeling whole in yourself and also feeling grounded. I think that there's a thing to being grounded and feeling calm and where you are and who you are. It's not about like how much money you have. It's about knowing that you're safe and you're good and that you're clear. Mm, That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought wealth, you know, it obviously is, there's, there's an element of being financially just, you know, having that not giving you problems, but Mm -hmm. also there's so many other forms of wealth, you know, love wealth, right. uh, Family wealth, location wealth, health wealth. Right. So it's it's important to think realize that wealth means much more than just yeah just money you know, and you and you yeah. really are yeah living that yeah we like to leave our viewers with a meditation on what is an important life lesson that you have learned that is bringing you that has brought you the greatest amount of balance in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, really, just be yourself. That's it. I say it all the time. I'm like, we just have to be ourselves. Hmm. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to leave our viewers with, Tammy? No. It was so nice to meet you, Rakalita. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> We're going to go and play now. I'm going to call you that all the time, <laughs> okay, Daisy. Okay. okay. I love it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Where can our viewers find you on social media? Um, t- I'm on Instagram at Tammy Pardee, mm-hmm. Facebook at Tammy Pardee. We're at Party Properties at both Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of all of them. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having us on the mm. Mega Podcast. And thank you all to our wonderful viewers and listeners uh, for spending your time with me and for watching. And if you liked this podcast, please hit the like and subscribe button. And you can also follow us at mega-podcast.com. And thank you again. And until next time.